Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Charles Kim, and I'm here to facilitate tonight's Hawaii Pacific Health webinar. Tonight, we will discuss prostate cancer, an important topic considering that it is the most common cancer in men. We have a great panel who specializes in prostate cancer here tonight, and we hope that this seminar will impart knowledge and understanding to you and your loved ones who may be affected by this disease. Before we get started, a few reminders to our viewers. Tonight's webinar will be recorded. So after the event is completed, registered participants will receive a copy of tonight's recording. The event will also be available to view on our social media channels and websites. And for those who are joining us live, please feel free to submit questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can during the Q&A portion of the event. I would like to start off by introducing our speakers who graciously made time in their busy schedules tonight to be here. Uh, our first speaker, our first uh, speaker is Franklin Lee. Franklin Lee. Franklin Lee is a urologist at Pacific Health um, at the Pro Ridge uh, Clinic. He has been practicing for five years since his completion of residency at the University of Washington in 2016. He's an assistant clinical professor at UH School of Medicine and also UH Cancer Center, and is the principal investigator in a number of studies at the University of Hawaii Cancer Center. Next, we have Dr. Michael Roach. Dr. Michael Roach is a radiation oncologist at the Cancer Center of Hawaii. He was an assistant professor and chief of GI radiation oncology at WashU before coming to Hawaii in 2019. He's a reviewer for many um, medical journals. He's also assistant clinical professor at UH School of Medicine and serves on the Cancer Research Advisory Board at UH. Dr. Ian Okazaki is chief of oncology and hematology at Hawaii Pacific Health. He specializes in genital urinary oncology. He did his fellowship at the University of Minnesota. He's a clinical professor at the University of Hawaii School of Medicine and Cancer Center. Also as a principal investigator for a number of studies at UHCC. And I'm Charles Kim. I'm a urologist at Straw Pro Ridge. I've been practicing, practicing since 1996. I'm an assistant clinical professor at UH School of Medicine and Cancer Center, and also principal investigator for a number of studies. So to start off tonight, um, we're gonna talk about prostate cancer. And prostate cancer is the most common cancer in men in the United States. And it's also the number two cancer overall. There are over 250 thousand cases every year in the United States, and there are about 30,000 deaths every year. It is the second leading cause of cancer death in men. In Hawaii, there are an estimated 880 new cases every year with 180 deaths. Um, so, uh, tonight, we're going to talk about prevention and screening for prostate cancer, treatment for early and advanced prostate cancer, what's new in prostate cancer, cutting edge, cutting edge treatment, clinical trials, and finally, coordination of cancer care in Hawaii. <clears throat> Dr. Lee, uh, as a urologist, you see and treat many patients with prostate cancer. Are there any ways that men can reduce their risk of getting prostate cancer? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and thank, thanks for everyone being here. Um, so prostate cancer, um, like Dr. Kim mentioned, is a very common cancer here in the United States. And um, there are certain risk factors that men may have um, in getting prostate cancer. Uh, the most common risk factors um, that we think of are age, 
Uh, so older men in general are more likely to get prostate cancer. Um, race, uh, African Americans in general are at higher risk of getting prostate cancer, um, as well as um, relatively higher risk of Caucasians. Um, Asians and Asian Americans slash Pacific Islanders in general are actually protected against prostate cancer, which is why um, the rates of prostate cancer here in Hawaii um, are slightly different than that of the mainland the United States. And when we talk about prostate cancer prevention, um, one of the most common topics that I get asked uh, has to do with uh, nutrition and, and prostate cancer. Um, so I don't know if we can pull up the slides for um, so, uh, you know, what I would say is there, you know, the bottom line is that there's no one thing that can prevent or take away your risk of prostate cancer. Um, but there is um, a lot of questions and um, a lot of interest um, in what types of foods we can eat. Um, are there supplements that we can take that might reduce our risk of getting prostate cancer? Um, and unfortunately, the bottom line is not really. Um, there, there is some evidence that some, some types of supplements may have maybe benefit, but there's, there's nothing that's been definitively shown to reduce our risk of prostate cancer. And what I'm going to do um, just for the next couple of minutes is go over um, some of the very common things that are talked about. Uh, the first one being lycopene. So lycopene um, is very is a very kind of popular supplement uh, for men and, and prostate cancer. And, you know, if you go to GNC or, or buy even Costco, they have uh, prostate cancer supplements. And if you look at the list, lycopene will, will be in there. And um, it's, it's found in many plants. Um, and the most kind of common thing you find them in are, are things like tomatoes, tomato products, tomato paste, things like that. Um, and, um, other things like guava, watermelon, uh, you can only f also find it in. Um, so does it work? Well, you know, some, some studies have shown that um, lycopene levels in people with cancer are lower than those in without cancer, prostate cancer specifically. And uh, some population data from 2015 and 2017 have shown that higher lycopene intake was associated with lower prostate cancer risk. Um, but data is mixed. So a very large study in 2006 with hundreds of thousands of people uh, found no link between lycopene and diet and prostate cancer risk. Um, so the bottom line um, with lycopene, and, and you'll see kind of a trend among all the other ones, is that it's safe, but not approved for prostate cancer treatment, and it is available in over-the-counter supplement. Uh, next slide. So um, another one that's very popular is selenium and vitamin E. Um, vitamin Selenium is found in many fruits, uh, including meats, vegetables, nuts. It is an essential vitamin. Uh, vitamin E is also found in many, many supplements like vegetable oil, nuts, egg yolk. And um, this is interesting because there actually was a cancer prevention trial that looked at both selenium and vitamin E. And they found that selenium had no difference in the rate of developing prostate cancer. And in fact, high doses of selenium can actually increase the risk of having aggressive prostate cancer. Although I put in quotes that that's not entirely clear. Now vitamin E taken alone, um, so this select trial, they actually looked at people, they randomized people to taking just selenium or vitamin E and people who took high doses of vitamin E alone actually had an increased risk of prostate cancer by about 17%. Um, the bottom line for these two supplements is um, probably shouldn't be taking more than the above recommended doses of vitamin E or selenium, and neither is approved for prostate cancer prevention. Next slide. What about vitamin D? That's also a very common um, supplement that, that patients will ask about. It's found in many supplements such as fish, liver oil, eggs. Um, a 2008 study found no link between prostate cancer risk and vitamin D. Whereas in 2018, 
it actually found that high levels of vitamin D can be linked with higher risk of prostate cancer. Um, they did a very nice controlled randomized trial in 2018 that showed that vitamin D supplement, supplementation did not lower rate of any cancer. So again, the bottom line is vitamin D does not seem to affect prostate cancer. In fact, it may it's linked with higher risk. And so you really shouldn't be taking the above recommended dosing of vitamin D. Next. Now, green tea is a really interesting one. Um, and, and it was kind of first explored because um, the prostate cancer risk in Japan is actually very low. And the Japanese drink a lot of green tea. And um, they found that population studies um, that high levels of polyphenols, which is the chemical in green tea, may lower risk of prostate cancer, although this is mixed. And they've done two randomized trials that show that men, in men of, with high risk of prostate cancer, so those with strong family histories or a prior biopsy that showed potentially a higher risk of cancer, actually had lower rates of cancer than those who took placebo, which is um, like a sugar pill. And it also showed that green tea may actually also lower PSA and lower risk of prostate cancer in these men with high risk. And um, this was so promising that, you know, there's currently a trial that we're doing at Hawaii Pacific Health and the UH Cancer Center. Um, I believe Dr. Kim is the principal investigator for this. And the goal is to look to see if prostate, if green tea can actually help quote unquote treat prostate cancer. So, patients with low risk prostate cancer on active surveillance are randomized to a sugar pill or green tea supplementation. Um, so that's an exciting research topic that's being done here at, um, in Hawaii. So the bottom line is there is some evidence that green tea is helpful, but you know the, it's somewhat mixed, um, but it is not dangerous to, to drink green tea. Um, so you know that was kind of a long-winded answer, but you know, to answer Dr. Kim's question, um, there's no real way to prevent prostate cancer, um, although staying healthy and um, you know preventing heart disease, you know losing weight, all of those things, exercise um, probably has some influence on overall risk, um, et cetera. That's uh, that was a great summary, and uh, uh, I think. Uh, the green tea study that we're going to do at Hawaii is going to be a very interesting study. Um, when you see a patient, how do you screen for prostate cancer, Dr. Lee? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, prostate cancer is a, um, we consider it kind of like a silent cancer. That's why you screen for it. Um, in general, there aren't really any symptoms of prostate cancer. Um, typically, urinary symptoms are not associated with prostate cancer, although they can be. Um, you know, there, there's multiple different societies that have their own recommendations on who and when to screen for prostate cancer, um, including the American Urologic Association, the American Cancer Society, um, uh, internal medicine, family medicine, etc. Um, in general, um, we want to screen men who um, have a, who are going to live um, a long period of time. So in general, um, the screening recommendations are for men from 55 to 69, um, at least annually or every other year. Uh, very good. Um, uh, we're also doing some other tests for uh, patients who are high risk for prostate cancer, um, specifically MRIs. Um, can you tell us about that? Yeah, um, MRIs are, are a relatively new uh, imaging modality um, that's really gotten popular in the last several years. And the benefit of MRI is it's able to um, you know, previously we were recommending biopsies where it was somewhat random. We would take biopsies of the prostate in a grid-like pattern um, and, you know, almost kind of quote unquote hope to hit the cancer. Uh, the MRI can actually let us see spots um, within the prostate that we can target, um, 
using an MRI study. So that's been very promising um, for directed biopsies. Um, and one of the problems with MRI is sometimes the MRI doesn't show a spot and there's cancer there. Um, and so one, you know, another study that we're doing here in Hawaii is we're um, getting MRIs on patients who are gonna have their prostate removed and actually compare um, spots on the MRI and see how well they correlate where, where, you know, where we find the cancer within the prostate. That'll help us um, guide patients um, to kind of let them know how good MRI is in the future. Great, yeah. So we, we've been doing these MRIs now for a number of years and I think it really has helped um, help us uh, screen them in a much more efficient manner. So our understanding of cancer um, has really grown over the last few years, especially in the field of genetics. Uh, Dr. Okazaki, do genetics play a role in prostate cancer? They absolutely do. Um, this is a field all in itself, and there's uh, gene testing that's done typically on um, many, many cancer patients because of the possibility of this being a hereditary cancer, determining hereditary risk. So there's um, two types of testing in general. And then uh, this is terminology. Again, there's what's called germline testing, meaning is this something that you were born with? Was it passed from mother mother or father down, down through to um, children? Um, and germline testing is typically done nowadays through either the blood or a, a cheek swab or saliva. So I think most people are familiar with Ancestry and 23andMe. Those are gene, that's gene, you know, sequencing to, and they can tell you where your ancestors came from. So we can do the same thing for in the medical world and we can do the same thing in the cancer world. So in the cancer world, you can t uh, check for DNA mutations that predispose to cancers such as prostate cancer. Prostate cancer, there are a handful of genes that do predispose to cancer and can be hereditary. So the answer to that question is yes. The other type of, of gene testing is actually on the cancer cell itself. So this is not, nothing to do with hereditary, but when the cancer, when the prostate cell becomes cancerous, it becomes cancerous because there are mutations in the DNA that set the cell off to become malignant and they grow. So you can actually test those cells to see if there are mutations, DNA mutations, that triggered the cancer to grow or to promote the cancer uh, to grow some more or spread. That testing is called somatic testing. So we do somatic gene testing. So you test, test the cancer itself to see if there are mutations. The reason that's important is because you can detect certain mutations that you can target nowadays with specific therapies. So there's somatic testing on the cancer itself, and there's germline testing on the saliva or blood to look to see if there's something hereditary. So lots of excitement in that genetic world. Oh, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so now that we have a better understanding about screening and genetics, uh, Dr. Roach, if someone was unfortunately um, developing prostate cancer, uh, how do we figure out how to take care of them? Can you briefly talk about grade and staging of prostate cancer? Yeah, after a man's been diagnosed with prostate cancer, there's two things we look at uh, as doctors to help us determine what's the best course of action. One of them's stage, which is where the cancer is in a man's body. Another is grade, which is what the cancer looks like under the microscope. And I've got a slide to uh, demonstrate grade. So the way uh, we grade prostate cancer is what's called the Gleason score. It's named after the pathology physician who started this system. And what you look at is it's a score of one to five. And it, the score of one is that the prostate cancer cells look pretty normal. They're round, uh, they look like a gland that's secreting uh, fluids like they should. And then it's a score that goes up to five where the cells become increasingly malignant. You can't recognize them for where, uh, what kind of cell they started from. And uh, they look much more aggressive under the microscope. So it's a score of one to five. And what happens is when the pathologist looks at this under the microscope, uh, they give you two scores. One is how the majority of the cells look. And then they also give you a second score of one to five based on what's the minority of the cells look like. And what you do is you take those two numbers and you add them together. 
And what happens is based on that sum is, is what we call uh, your risk category of prostate cancer. So we can go to the next slide. In general, uh, for it to be prostate cancer, it's usually a score uh, combined of six or higher. So a score of six is what we call low risk. A score of seven puts you in the intermediate risk group. And then a score of eight to 10 puts you in the high risk. And within these, you can also get further breakdowns. For low risk, we also have very low risk. Like there's only a few areas of Gleason score six in the prostate specimen. An intermediate category, we break it down favorable and unfavorable. Are the majority of the uh, prostate cancer cells a score of three, that's more favorable, or do more of them look like a score of four, which would put you in the unfavorable category. We also have high and very high risk where scores of nine to 10 or the majority of the specimens being involved would put you at a very high risk for this cancer uh, spreading and not responding to treatment. So that's grade of uh, cancer. Stage tells us where uh, the cancer has gone to in the body. Stage four for prostate cancer usually means that it's spread to the lymph nodes or outside of the pelvis. A stage of one to three means it's limited to the prostate, but that's based on various features like the amount of uh, prostate that's involved as well as this Gleason score. So uh, when a patient has a uh, early stage prostate cancer, Dr. Rocha, what are the treatment options um, for this kind of patient? So there's three main treatment options for the low risk patients. One is uh, surgery, uh, another is radiation therapy, my specialty, which I'll talk more about here uh, later on in the webinar. Another uh, option is what we call active surveillance. It might seem uh, counterintuitive that we're just going to surveil or watch this cancer but a lot of uh, prostate cancers grow very slowly. So what we can do is we can continue to watch this and uh, check the PSA uh, maybe a few times a year, maybe get imaging, maybe do physical exams once a year, but we're watching to see if it's changing and we're reserving treatment for if the cancer starts to grow or behave more aggressively. We're delaying treatment so that we can also delay any side effects of treatment and any impact on a patient's quality of life. Um, great, great. And then, uh, Dr. Lee, as a urologist, uh, you do surgery for patients who have early prostate cancer. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the kind of surgeries that are offered uh, to this to this patients who have early prostate cancer. Yeah, so surgery um, has been around for decades and um, is, was one of the, um, you know, like all cancers, uh, one of the first treatments that were done for prostate cancer. And um, traditionally in the past, uh, surgeries were done with a um, fairly large open incision. Um, and patients who had this surgery usually were in the hospital for several days. Um, you could expect a fair amount of blood loss um, and, a and a fair amount of complications, including urinary incontinence um, and things like that. Um, now we are, um, one of the new advances, especially within the last decade, is the advent of um, minimally invasive and, and robotic surgeries. Um, so we have a couple of videos just to highlight um, the robotic technique. Um, so this is the Da Vinci robot, um, where the robot's on the left side, um, and the surgeon actually sits in the, uh, on the right side in, in that stool. and. Um, looks inside to control the robot. And so if we can start the video. Um, so um, this is kind of just showing, you know, what the robot is. And this is actually what it looks like on the inside. Um, so, you know, you, you have these instruments, um, which the surgeon actually controls. And, um, you know, the benefit of doing robotic surgery is you get very precise uh, movement and you you don't have any of the tremor um, that that you might have if you were doing it um, live um, without the robot and you're able to very precisely manage um, tissue and and things like that. Um, next slide. Oh yeah, so um, I think I'm not sure if this is the other video. So this is kind of the same thing, the the robot and you know. Um, 
when we do robotic surgery for prostate, you know, this is kind of showing the, the instruments that we use um, that are, you know, they're actually very small um, and, and we're able to control these uh, instruments. And this is just a, you know, a schematic of what it looks like when, when we're um, cartoon, so to speak, of re removing the prostate. So um, what we actually do is we physically um, cut the prostate from the bladder. So the prostate surrounds the urethra. Um, this is showing the nerves. So um, the nerves that control erections um, are being um, spared in this patient. Um, and then we cut the prostate out from the urethra. And then we actually kind of sew you back together. Um, and um, you know, this surgery usually takes about three to three and a half hours and patients go home the next day. Uh, whereas, you know, in the past, they were in the hospital for several days and blood loss is, is very minimal. Now that's a great advance that we have now in, um, <clears throat> in surgery that we can do um, robotic surgery. And just like Dr. Lee says, uh, patients uh, really um, recover very quickly. But I also know that uh, in the radiation world, there's been a lot of advances also. Um, so Dr. Roche, maybe you can explain exactly what radiation therapy is and um, how you use it for your patients. Yeah, radiation therapy has also made a lot of advances over the past few decades. Radiation uses high strength x-rays to damage cells and cancer cells tend to be more susceptible to this. So it's an alternative to surgery uh, to help treat prostate cancer uh, with curative intent. And there's two kinds of radiation therapy. We can deliver radiation therapy from the outside in, and then we can also deliver radiation therapy from the inside out. The most common is delivering it from the outside in, what we call external beam radiation therapy. And this, uh, uh, we can show on the slide, uses a machine called a linear accelerator. Here at Cancer Center of Hawaii with uh, Hawaii Pacific Health, we use a true beam, which is one of the most modern machines out there. And we uh, use a technique called intensity modulated radiation therapy. The way it works is a man comes in for treatment that takes about 10 minutes a day and he rests on the table. And this machine rotates around delivering high intensity x-rays, but you still can't feel them. There's no heat, there's no shock. And as soon as the treatment's uh, done, there's zero radiation therapy radiation left inside a man, so he's no risk to his family. There's no special precautions he would need to take. This treatment takes about 10 minutes a day. We deliver it Monday to Friday for uh, anywhere from four to nine weeks. The other alternative is where we deliver radiation therapy from the inside out, what we call brachytherapy. And this is where we insert radiation seeds into the prostate. We can go to the next slide. These seeds are microscopic. They're much, uh, they're much smaller than a grain of sand. And this is delivered while a man's in the operating room under anesthesia. We inject about 20 needles to place these seeds and these get left behind. Top two, you can see pictures of what these seeds look like and how they, uh, their size in comparison to a penny. And then below you'll see an X-ray uh, where these uh, seeds are injected into the whole prostate and delivers radiation therapy from the inside out. This does uh, leave radiation therapy that's uh, delivered in the man for the coming weeks. So there are some precautions we would have him take, uh, particularly around small children and pregnant women. Both of these are good options too for uh, curative intent therapy uh, for prostate cancer. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, there has been a lot of uh, advances in uh, radiation. Uh, you're able to deliver um, the radiation much more precisely now. Uh, you guys are doing um, image-guided image uh, RT now. And, and um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about some of the little advances that have been, that you have at your center? Yeah, so oftentimes every time a man gets a treatment, we take a low resolution CAT scan of them so that we can uh, adjust the treatment down to be precise down to just a, um, the millimeter level. And this man would get this every day. We can also monitor his bladder filling because the fuller a man's bladder is during treatment, the more it can move sensitive organs like the intestines away from the radiation beam. 
We also offer uh, a new technique that involves uh, injecting a gel that helps us separate the prostate from the rectum and helps minimize the radiation dose this receives. This is a device that just came out a few years ago and we're a high volume center for this. We inject this gel as an outpatient procedure and uh, under local anesthesia only, the man goes home uh, after this 10, 15 minute procedure and it really helps minimize any uh, side effects from treatment. Very nice, very nice. Uh, so now, now that we um, understand some of the treatments that we can do for patients who have early prostate cancer, uh, let's move on to patients who have a more advanced prostate cancer. Uh, Dr. Ogazaki, um, can you describe uh, the treatments that you have for patients who have a more advanced prostate cancer? Sure, and when we talk about advanced prostate cancer, this is prostate cancer typically that's spread outside of the prostate. So it could be the lymph nodes, which are next to or somewhat removed from the prostate or to organs like lung or bone or liver. And uh, this is, of course, the most advanced um, type uh, stage four prostate cancer. And um, in this realm, we're typically talking about prostate cancer control and not cure, whereas Dr. Lee and Dr. Roach are uh, intervening in early earlier stages of prostate cancer for cure. So when we have advanced prostate cancer, the, the, the trick is to control the disease um, since we are no longer able to eradicate it once it's spread to outside the prostate itself. Um, the, the thing to remember is that control is sometimes um, quite good and it lasts for quite, quite a long time. The backbone of prostate cancer control is actually it centers around testosterone, the male hormone. The male hormone stimulates the, the prostate cancer to grow. The reason being is prostate itself, that gland, the sole purpose of the prostate is to make semen, or that, that fluid uh, that comes out in the ejaculate. And um, what makes the semen uh, produce is the testosterone, the male hormone stimulates the prostate cells. It can generate semen and it can store it as a carrier for the sperm. The, um, when prostate cells become cancerous, they still have that sensitivity or that receptor that, that binds to the testosterone. The testosterone binds the receptor and then it stimulates the cell, prostate cell to make semen. In the case of a cancer cell, the hormone will bind to the prostate cancer cell and will stimulate the cancer to grow. So in this situation, the prostate, the, the testosterone is the, is the enemy. It's gonna stimulate the cancer to grow and spread. So the goal would be to, to shut off the testosterone production. And there's a few ways of doing that. The old fashioned way is to just remove the testes because that's where the majority of the testosterone is produced. Um, that's called an orchiectomy or castration. Um, we, we now have um, medicines that actually shut off testosterone production from the testes. And these are typically injections. Um, and they're, they're injected either into the muscle or under the skin at some interval, whether it's monthly or every three months or every six months. We now have uh, recently um, an FDA approved oral therapy that does the same thing. It shuts off testosterone and that's also available. Um, so shutting off the testosterone will starve the cancer cell of the fuel that needs to grow. And so the prostate cancer will die back, and, but you can't kill all the cancer cells. So some will, will remain, but getting that initial prostate cancer to recede by shutting off testosterone is the main, the backbone of therapy. What we've learned is that that works and it holds prostate cancer steady for just a period of time. After some time that goes by, which is quite variable, the PSA will start growing, rising and the prostate cancer will start growing again in spite of the low testosterone. And that now indicates that your prostate cancer has transformed into a more aggressive form of disease we call castrate resistant. So castrate sensitive means that it's still responding to the low testosterone levels. Once the testosterone levels are low and the cast and the, the um, PSA starts to rise and the prostate cancer starts to grow, that's castrate resistant, meaning it's resistant to lowering testosterone. So in the you know nowadays when we treat prostate cancer, advanced stage, we usually use these medicines to lower the testosterone and we typically add other things and we have other medicines or oral therapies that are, that have come online and they're FDA approved that help to improve the 
sensitivity of the cancer cell to that low testosterone, or they help to make that testosterone lowering process even more efficient. And we have medicines like abiraterone and enzalutamide and apalutamide and darolutamide. So these may be familiar, familiar sounding drugs to, to some of you, but these are drugs that are used to to increase the quality of the response to that lowering of testosterone. We still use chemotherapy for folks that have advanced prostate cancer in certain circumstances. And then we have some other um, uh, little more, I guess, high-tech therapies. There's actually a vaccine that's been approved for quite some time for prostate cancer. It's called Cipulu cell T cell, which engineers one's own immune cells to, to help fight the prostate cancer. Um, that's used only in the case where you have metastatic prostate cancer or advanced prostate cancer that's no longer responding to testosterone. But you can't have disease that's too far advanced, then that, that immune therapy doesn't really work very well. The newer forms of immune therapy that you see on commercials that we use for lung cancer, melanoma, kidney cancer, head and neck cancer, all kinds of cancers, don't really work on prostate cancer. There's only a certain, very small subset in which they do work. Um, and then there's, um, there's radiation therapy for, for um, cancer that's spread to certain organs, typically the bone. But if the cancer is spread to an area that's causing pain or it's bleeding, Dr. Roach can come in and, and I call it spot weld, these trouble spots. And it really helps to control symptoms and it helps to improve quality of life. We have injectable uh, radi radioactive particles or radionuclides uh, that are also effective in treating predominantly prostate cancer that's in the bone. That's, that tends to be for more advanced disease. So as you can see, the menu is quite large now. It has, we still have a long way to go, but it's, it's much better than it used to be five or 10 years ago. Wow, that was a mouthful. Um, you, know, you know, I would say um, some of the greatest advances in prostate cancer over the last five years has, has been in the uh, medical oncology um, realm, you know, the, all these new drugs that are out there that have really helped the, the patient who has advanced prostate cancer. So it's a very exciting time. Um, so just to change, oh, do you talk a little bit about clinical trials, Dr. Okazaki. What is the value of clinical trials? I'm glad you asked that because this, this pertains not just to prostate cancer, but just cancer in general. Um, clinical trials are uh, how we um, design studies so that we can advance cancer care. And you have to realize that some of these clinical trials are for folks who don't have cancer, but we're trying to look for cancer. So screening, there's, there's clinical trials that help to prevent cancer. And then there, there are tr clinical trials that, that are designed to improve treatment for cancer. So um, these are all uh, research studies that are looking to advance the field of cancer research. Clinical trials are really important in every in patient care in general because it often gives people a, uh, an option to, um, in addition to what's considered standard therapy, to maybe be exposed to something that's um, new, um, promising, and perhaps even more effective than what's considered standard of care. So clinical trials would be, it's best to have this discussion with the nurses and the, the doctors and other providers in the clinic, uh, because sometimes there are clinical trials that people are eligible for, or they fit uh, for your treatment. And we would always like to have people participate in clinical trials because, um, Folks tend to do better when they when they participate in clinical trials, and uh, we also get smarter. We learn what what's works and what doesn't work, and and how we can uh, advance the field. Very good, thank you. Uh, so uh, to change gears um, a bit, uh, at Hawaii Pacific Health, we we worked hard to uh, develop a comprehensive cancer program for all types of cancer, including prostate cancer. Uh, Dr. Okazaki, um, can you talk about the advances that HPH has made and why patients should consider getting their cancer care at Hawaii Pacific Health? So one of the um, uh, kind of recent uh, programmatic and you know, structural builds for cancer care um, at HPH um, has really helped to um, just improve quality and 
just have patients get in a more comprehensive cancer care. And one of the main things that uh, has helped us in this effort has been to really specialize our providers. And so we're talking about prostate cancers. So the folks that you see on screen here are you know, prostate cancer specialists. And so when you have the diagnosis of prostate cancer, you're going to be seen by not anybody in the group, but some of the, some of the folks in our group. Uh, and the ones that you, you'll be seeing are the ones that are focused in your type of cancer. So you know, we do have breast cancer teams and lung cancer teams. And you know, we, our group, we were called genital urinary or GU oncology. So that's kidney, ureter, bladder, prostate, testis. So that's, that's what we focus on. So having that spe subspecialization is really important because it really focuses the attention on the, the cancer that you have and it provides you know, more comprehensive care. Um, how this all starts is really um, once the diagnosis is made, um, the, the, we have a triage system, meaning that the diagnosis is made, be the primary care doctor or somebody would say, hey, there's a prostate cancer. Uh, that we just discovered, where do I turn to? So we have a hotline or a triage line that, that folks can call, primary doctors can call, or patients can call. And you typically get, get hooked up with a nurse navigator. The nurse navigator is the one who helps to navigate or, or take people from the beginning through their course of uh, um, treatment. And the, the key here is finding the, you know, the, the right place, the right place to start. So if there's a prostate cancer that may need to see Dr. Lee or Dr. Roach, that the nurse navigator will, will get all the information and then have the doctors, uh, providers take a look at it and see where the that first patient should, should, where the patient should be seen first. In general, we like, for prostate cancer, we like to be seen by the entire team. So, but sometimes it's critical to know where to start. Um, the navigator uh, has at his or her fingertips um, other members of the team. Uh, we have the social workers who who do um, a lot of things that help that help patients get support that they need, and we have these uh, specialists who are um, oncology program liaisons who help help with a lot of the things that that you may not initially think about, but are. Uh, big deal, like how much does this cost? And a lot of the, the drugs that we use or the procedures that we do are quite costly. And there are ways of, you know, figuring out the financial aspects of this and also to provide help when the cost of things are expensive. There are lots of grants and there are some foundations that help with uh, defray some costs. Um, our, we have a nurse practitioner core who um, help us take care of patients as, as they go through their treatments, but they're also involved in what we call survivorship. These are folks to the process to make sure that patients get seen by the appropriate person and get uh, treatments that are according to uh, national and sometimes international guidelines, just so that patients know that they're being um, taken in and uh, are being treated along the proper pathways and guidelines that have been set up that have been proven to be effective. Um, the navigation aspect also includes, you know, interaction with the University of Hawaii Cancer Center where clinical trials um, come, th come from. Um, and also, you know, we talked about genetics. So we have genetic counselors. So a lot of the times patients will have to speak with genetic counselors and have gene testing depending on the situation. If they're family members that have prostate cancer or breast cancer or other cancers, if there's gene testing that's been shown to have maybe a hereditary link, that's when it's important to have all those folks get involved. So as you can see, it's quite comprehensive and it's designed purposely for the care of not just the patient, but the family and the caregivers as well. <clears throat> Very good. I, I, I do think one of the strengths at HPH is that we do have um, a very comprehensive team, a very comprehensive approach to all types of cancer, including prostate cancer. And uh, Dr. Okazaki is proud. He's the only one in the state who specializes just in genital urinary cancer. So he's uh, more than just a, a general oncologist, but he actually specializes in GU oncology. Um, so um, we have a lot of questions uh, from the audience, some very good questions. Uh, so I think we're going to jump into those questions. Um, the first subject is uh, about BPH and prostate cancer. Is there a relationship between the two? Um, Dr. Lee, you, can you uh, answer that question? 
Yeah, that's that's a very common question uh, that people have, and um, they're very commonly confused. Um, so BPH or an enlarged prostate um, typically will cause urinary symptoms. So uh, maybe you're waking up three or four times at night. Maybe you've noticed that your urination is very slow. Um, maybe you have a lot of frequency and urgency. It's very common that men will think of this as, you know, maybe signs of cancer. And um, that, that really um, is, is untrue. Um, so if prostate cancer is very advanced, so advanced prostate cancer um, can cause urinary symptoms, but in general, um, prostate cancer has no symptoms. Um, that's why um, men are encouraged to screen for prostate cancer because it is oftentimes asymptomatic. So the urinary aspects of the prostate um, is almost completely separated from the cancer aspects of the prostate. There's some very small overlap, but again, in a very small proportion of patients when it's very aggressive. Oh, very good. Um, how important is the digital rectal exam? Um, that's a great question. Um, I, I think it has fallen out of favor um, for a lot of physicians. Um, and some physicians are even recommending not doing rectal exams. Um, I still find it important to do, um, maybe not every year, but uh, at least when I first meet someone, um, you can find nodules or spots on the prostate, uh, even with a low PSA. Uh, the PSA is the blood test that screens for prostate cancer. So, and those spots or nodules can harbor um, cancer, which you know could be even aggressive cancer. So, um, I do think it is an important part of the physical exam. Um, although I, I do recognize that there is some controversy that, and some physicians are are not actively doing it. Okay. Some other questions have are going to Dr. Roach is. Um, uh, Someone in the audience asked about proton beam treatment, also SBRT. Um, can you discuss those things? Yeah, protons are a relatively newer form of radiation. They're a special type of radiation that can go so far and we can get them to stop where we want them to. Uh, it's a new form of radiation. Uh, it's generally uh, only in larger centers on some of the cities in like California, like San Francisco or in Oregon, but it's also a very costly uh, treatment. It's anywhere from like five or more times more expensive than intensity modulated therapy, which we offer here. So it's a lot more expensive. So the question is, does it offer a benefit? And there's some studies which suggest it does, but there's other studies that suggest uh, because of the nature of the protons, it might be causing worse symptoms. So right now there's a national trial going on where he heads patients get uh, intensity modulated radiation therapy, tails they get proton therapy because we're uh, trying to investigate is this uh, actually helping patients or is it a more expensive treatment that doesn't have any clinical difference. So that's an ongoing uh, national trial trying to answer that. Uh, stereotactic body radiation therapy is a highly intense, highly focused treatment where we uh, do it's a five treatments. So it's very precise. Uh, the treatments take a little longer, 30 to 40 minutes, uh, but that's another option for uh, prostate cancer. Both, all of these treatments, stereotactic body radiation therapy, proton therapy, intensity modulated radiation therapy, uh, would be expected and have been shown to have similar cancer control rates. It's all a question of uh, convenience for the patient and different uh, side effects with the different options. Thank you. Um, now, there have been some questions here about uh, brachytherapy. So I know that you had uh, talked about that. You showed some models, um, but I guess they're, um, they want to know a little bit more about brachytherapy and uh, how long does it take and how long does it last? How does it compare to external beam? Those are all good questions. Again, I think the uh, con cancer control rate would be the same between this and external beam treatment. 
uh, brachytherapy is a one-time procedure. So it's a one-time uh, procedure in the operating room. Uh, it's relatively low risk on the scheme of surgeries. Uh, the procedure itself takes about an hour under general anesthesia. There is a mapping session that gets done a few weeks beforehand. Uh, this involves uh, ultrasound uh, in the rectum where we measure the prostate gland size and we map it out so that we could uh, decide like how many seeds, where the seeds need to go and uh, uh, come up with a plan for that. The, not every man is a candidate for this. If the gland's too large, we get worried about uh, the side effects of the brachytherapy. The urinary side effects tend to be a little bit more with this approach. And by that, I mean uh, waking up more at night, needing to run to the bathroom more often. So for a man who already has a lot of these urinary issues, it might not be the uh, best treatment option. Uh, the other thing is uh, whether or not uh, having this internal radiation and taking precautions with those around you is going to cause a problem. For uh, younger men with families at home or for uh, men who take care of uh, their grandchildren or others, it might not be the best option either. But yeah, it's a one-time treatment that takes about an hour in the operating room and about a short uh, 15, 20 minute mapping procedure done in the weeks, weeks beforehand. And um, uh, Franklin, can you talk a little bit about um, prostate surgeries, focusing on the um, possible side effects uh, that a man typically may have with prostate surgery? Yeah, um, it's a great question. So the, the most common side effects, um, it is a surgery. It is a, um, a, a significant surgery. So there's always the risk of heart attack, stroke, injury to other organs, bleeding, infection, things like that. Um, but really the two most common symptoms after surgery are incontinence or leakage or an impotence or loss of erections. Um, so incontinence uh, is very similar to um, when women um, give birth, they have, um, you know, leakage with laughing, coughing, sneezing. Uh, it's called stress incontinence. Um, in general, um, all men will have stress incontinence after surgery. Um, that improves as time goes on. Um, a meaningful statistic that I give is um, anywhere between 90 to 95% of men by one year after surgery will have very little or no leakage after prostate surgery. So really the percentage of men that have permanent leakage is, is quite low. Um, impotence or loss of erection is a, um, can be a very big deal for um, a lot of men. And um, in general, erections do tend to be worse after prostate cancer surgery. Um, there are nerves that run along the prostate um, that control the erections. And when we do the surgery, we make every effort to save these nerves. Um, one of the problems um, is, you know, why don't we always save the nerves? Um, because of how closely associated the nerves are to the prostate, aggressive cancers can grow into the nerves. And by saving them, you can leave cancer behind. So there's always a delicate balance uh, between preserving function, um, you know, sexual function and cancer control. Um, and we always have to kind of ride that balance uh, in the most appropriate way, looking at MRIs, uh, biopsy information, and so forth. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, maybe I'll direct this question to Dr. Okazaki. Um, in regards to treatment for prostate cancer, um, does surgery or radiation have a better rate of cure? Well, so that's, that's a that hard would, question, isn't it? <laughs> it's hard because, because there's not a straight answer to it. And it depends on the, the risk, risk factors that Dr. Roach was speaking of. Um, in general, if there's a, someone with a high risk or very high risk, there, there may be features of the prostate cancer that tell you that you might be able to go in there and cut it out, but you might have a higher chance of leaving things behind or not being able to cut everything out. And, uh, you know, of course, Dr. Lee can go into the details about that. So there are some situations where, yes, you can do either. They both, both options should be curative, but you may have a more likelihood of, uh, you know, catching it all or not, not going through a surgery, having to recover from surgery and yet having the cancer can recur, you know, because the risk was too high to, to go in there and get surgery, in which case you would, you would lean more toward radiation oncology. And this is the key for 
us to when you come to, into prostate cancer clinic is to be able to to speak with Dr. Roach and Dr. Lee and and the medical oncologist because then you get the um, kind of a full breadth of the 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 subtleties of the uh, you know the the cancer that you have the characteristics and what the options and what the best option may be so it may be not be that we're going to tell you you should do this but we'll tell you that the data say that you may be you know better served by this or the other and. It, you, you, to some extent, it's good to get the advice of the others that that surgery, the surgeon that doesn't do radiation, radiation therapy doesn't do do, do uh, surgery. So that that way you can get a, you know, kind of a good feel of of what what the best option is for me. The other thing that uh, we do through HPH uh, in general is uh, we have these tumor conferences that Chuck, Ch Charles Kim run, Dr. Kim runs the prostate cancer, the GU oncology tumor board, where we discuss the tough cases like this. And then we, as a group collectively, the surgeon, radiation oncologist, the pathologist, the, the nurses and the other um, people on the team, can we can discuss it and we can come up with um, recommendations, you know, diagnosis, you know, treatment planning and perhaps the best best treatment options for the patient. And that gets back to you after it's been discussed in, in tumor conference. So I didn't answer the question straight out, but but those are the difficult choices that have to be made sometimes. Yeah, that, that's a very um, difficult question to answer, you know, and it really does depend on the individual and the specifics of their cancer, um, their grade and their stage. So and, on, and other aspects of their health and other uh, different things like that. So that's, um, that's why it's important to be able to talk to a specialist who uh, does a lot of these procedures, uh, who takes care of a lot of these patients because they, they know the little nuances about uh, the care for these patients. Um, Dr. Roche, there's uh, another question for you. It's about SBRT. Uh, is it offered in Hawaii? And then also maybe if you can talk a little bit about um, focal therapy. Yeah, we do offer uh, SBRT. It's a relatively newer technique. Uh, that tends to be for patients with lower risk disease where we only need to treat the prostate itself. For the higher uh, risk disease, we often wanna treat the pelvic lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are like the drains of the body where cancer can spread to next. And so for the higher risk patients, uh, we know that treating those can offer a benefit to a man. So we wouldn't necessarily offer this very focal treatment to the prostate only for the higher risk uh, patients. For focal therapy, uh, the standard is usually to treat the entire gland with radiation. We get worried about microscopic disease uh, being missed. We often do focal therapy if it's failed prior radiation therapy, because uh, we know the risks of coming back in with more radiation on tissue that's already received it. Uh, but uh, generally, we'd want to treat the entire gland to take care of anything microscopic that might be hiding out that might not show up on an MRI or other tests. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Um, Dr. Okazaki, there have been a few questions about liquid and blood biopsies. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about that and is that available for prostate cancer? Yes, it's available for prostate cancer, it's available for all cancers, in fact. Um, so a liquid biopsy, it sounds fancy, but it's really a blood test. And what you're looking for are is cancer DNA that circulates in the bloodstream. So once you have a cancer, some of it gets released and you can actually catch these in the bloodstream nowadays. And what they'll do is they'll catch the DNA and they'll, they'll look for cancer genes and they can look for mutations. So that's, that's one way of doing it. Um, it's used actually to look for mutations in the cancer. It's not used at this point for screening. It's not reliable enough. Uh, to be used as a screening tool. Um, the, the tissue biopsy, uh, you can also do those kinds of gene testing on tissue biopsy. That's, that's uh, probably preferred. Sometimes you can't do a biopsy for whatever reason, in which case the liquid biopsy is, is then an option. The tissue biopsy gives you more information than the liquid biopsy in general, but they're both available, yes. <clears throat> okay, great. This there's a lot more great questions out there, but I'm, I'm just so sorry we, we're running out of time. So uh, I want to thank all our panelists who took their uh, took time today to uh, to talk to us um, and share their expertise in this important topic. And I also want to thank uh, our viewers watching at home. We hope that you're able to take away some helpful information. 
uh, that um, you learned a little bit about prostate cancer prevention as well as treatment options. And as you heard throughout today's program, HPH offers a comprehensive service uh, for you and your family. From virtual care uh, to video, to telephone, to in-person visits, uh, we're here to keep you healthier. If you have any questions regarding our services today or today's uh, webinar, please visit hawaiipacifichealth.org. So again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, good night, and hope you have a safe and happy, safe and healthy evening. Thank you very much.